I was thinking back to when the first time I met Olivier was, and actually there's a, a very clear answer. So I was visiting, I was in the early 80s, and I was visiting um, Chiro Chiliberto in Naples. And Olivier was also there at the same time with somebody more senior. So Chiro invited me and he invited somebody else. And Olivier and I were there and he was the, we were the kind of the junior people. And I think what happened is that Chiro wanted to get rid of us. So he sent us off to uh, Pompeii for the day. So we had a wonderful <laughs> visit to Pompeii. And ever since then, I've enjoyed getting to know Olivier and following his uh, mathematics. And I very much admire his uh, mathematical vision, taste, and expository style. So I'm pleased to have this uh, occasion to come and celebrate his birthday. Um, the organizers contacted me two, three days ago and asked me could I sort of take an extra couple minutes and talk about uh, one of Olivier's results. So I'm happy to do that. And it seems to me, thinking about this, that there, I mean, one could say that there, in, 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 in broad outline, kind of three main themes to, to Debar's math. So his, of course, he's well known for his work on abelian varieties on the Schottky problem. More recently, as we heard, he's been thinking a lot about the geometry of Fano manifolds. But in between there, he did some very important work on questions of positivity and connectedness theorems. And I think maybe that's not so well known to young people today. So that's what I want to talk about. So I want to talk for a few minutes about his um, work on connectedness and related questions. So, um, and maybe I'll start by, again, for people, this was very much in the air, whoops, a bunch of years ago, but maybe not so much now. So let me start about, uh, so I want to talk about DeBar's uh, connectedness theorems. And so let me start, I want to spend a couple minutes just explaining the context and background, and then I'll say a little bit about what his actual results. So uh, the starting point here is a theorem from uh, of Fulton and Hansen that was uh, proven in the late 70s. So I think it was proven in 78. So let me state the theorem. Uh, okay, so here's their theorem, their connectedness theorem. So let's let, uh, so let's let Z be a smooth, well, I'm sorry. Um, so Z will be just a projective variety. And uh, we, are cons we consider a map F, let's say, from Z to a product of two projective spaces of the same dimension, Pn cross Pn. And I, uh, we want to assume that the dimension of, of the image uh, is strictly bigger than n. So uh, the dimension of the image is at least n plus 1. I, I'm sorry, let me call this h. Sorry, I apologize, h. And then the theorem is that uh, uh, h inverse of the diagonal of projective space is connected. Okay. Now, uh, when you first see this, if you haven't seen this kind of thing before, it sounds completely pointless. Yes, it's connected. It's also non-empty, of course. It's non-empty and connected, but so what? Who cares? But it turns out that this, is a, this statement has many, many interesting applications. So let me, uh, so this has, uh, what the Fulton and Hansen realized is it's a sort of a general theorem that has many, uh, uh, it has many applications to questions about uh, uh, sub-varieties of projective space of relatively low co-dimension. That was the kind of the big topic in those days. So let's see, I'm going to send this up. Let's see, is this the second board? Yeah, OK. So let me just mention one. Uh, so here's a kind of a typical application. So let's say that x 
is a smooth variety of dimension M And now let's say that we have a map F from X to PN. We might as well make it finite, otherwise there's nothing to say. Finite. And uh, so the assertion is this. That, so the dimensional assertion is that 2M is bigger than N. And if F is not an embedding, then there must be points at which F ramifies. Uh, then uh, F must have ramification points. So for example, if we take N equals 3, then we can take M equals 2. And then the assertion is if you have a surface in P3 that's, you know, that has regular singularities, so double points, triple points, and pinch points, it must actually have some pinch points. You can't just have a surface in P3 with normal, with normal crossing singularities. Okay, so how does this follow from the Fulton Hansen theorem? So the idea, I mean, vaguely speaking, is we consider uh, the product of F with itself. Uh, so H will be F cross F, which will take X cross X to uh, PN cross PN. Okay, and then the numbers, this has dimension M, so this is 2M, this is N, and so the assertion is that then, uh, so then what the Hansen theorem, the Fulton Hansen theorem says is that the H inverse of the diagonal is connected. Okay, but let's see, this goes up, this goes up, and the last one should be just sitting there. Okay, okay, fine. So, okay, but now the question is, um, um, maybe I'll move, that's, this has a lot of shadows, maybe I'll move over here. But now the question is, what is H inverse of the diagonal? Well, but note, that uh, H inverse of the diagonal consists of two sets of points. So you get, first of all, so H inverse of the diagonal is pairs of points on X with the same image under F. So of course, the diagonal of X is here, but so is the double, the double point set of F. So these are the double points of F. So pairs of points, okay, pairs of points with the same image. Dis pairs of distinct points with the same image. Whoops. What is that? I'm, I do it by hand. Okay. So that's very. Okay. But now, um, okay. So now the point is that, uh, the point is then, so th the double locus of F by assumption is non empty. And uh, that's what it means that F is not an embedding. And of course, it has dimension as at least one for dimensional reasons. So what that means is we can find a, a curves of double points. But, um, but by, by the connectedness theorem, but if we take the closure of the double point locus of F, uh, this must meet the diagonal of X. Well, right, because we're saying that the inverse image of the diagonal is connected and we have the double point locus and we have the diagonal of X, so the closure of that the closure of the double point locus which must meet the diagonal. So what does this mean? So this means that we can find a sequence of points x, t, y, t. So this is a sequence of points on x. Uh, t ends in some curve. So that uh, f of x, t equals f of y, t. And in general, these are different. But there exists but, but they meet the diagonal, but you know, x, uh, it's some special value, x t star equals y t star. So we have a pair of double point, curve of double points. There has to be a curve of double points that meets the diagonal. So these double points come together, and this is a ramification point. Okay, so um, this is the typical application of the Fulton Hansen theorem. 
Well, just because you're going from, I mean, it's a, you're going from 2n to, you're going from 2m to n. I mean, 2n is big, is at least m plus 1, and the inverse image of the, di the diagonal has co-dimension m. I mean, it's just the, the, the dimensions work out. Yeah, so that's right. And so you have a curve of double points. If you have a surface cross surface mapping to three points, you can't have isolated double points. I mean, that's what we're saying. OK, so th this, this uh, leads to two questions. So, uh, so what, were the, what are the questions? So first of all, um, let me find out here. So what are some questions? So there are two kinds of questions. So first of all, um, uh, can one can one replace uh, p n by other by other varieties v? And secondly, uh, what's the property of the diagonal that's really making this true? So, um, so what? Uh, so what Olivier did is he, there's, in a sequence of papers, he he proved many other, many more general connectedness theorems, and in particular, really give a good answer to this. So I'm only going to discuss extremely special cases of what he does did, but you'll get a, a picture. So the first uh, thing uh, is, what about so what's one natural kind of variety? Well, what happens if you look at uh, abelian varieties? So let's say that A is a abelian variety. So can we prove an analog of the Fulton-Hansen connectedness theorem when the target is an abelian variety and not projective space? Well, of course, it can't be true, so direct analog uh, of the Fulton Hansen theorem can't be true uh, uh, because, after all, uh, because after all, this corollary is completely false for abelian varieties because there exist, uh, since there exist, there exist many unramified. Uh, Morphisms from Y to uh, A, because what you do is you replace. You look at uh, uh, the, the point is uh, the point is you can um, you start with with X in A, and then you pull back by an isogeny. So if you start with some like a hypersurface there, you take an isogeny, from a finite map from some other abelian variety. Hey, this is unramified et al. So there are many, many unramified maps. So the, I mean, people had wondered about this. Could, could you find a connectedness theorem for abelian varieties? And it was clear that the, that you, that the sort of natural statement wasn't true. But what Olivier realized is that this is basically the only the only thing that can happen. So that's the first theorem. I'm, again, I'm going to state. Do you mean y to the x? Well, I mean, therefore, I mean, this is etal, and so this is an unramified morphism, right? I mean, it's, it's. I'm thinking. I mean, really, the theorem would be for okay. things mapping into A, but it's okay. So, um, okay. So here is a very special case of his theorem. Uh, so let's say that, uh, so the, what he realized, his whole idea is that you need to study kind of all of, the, all of these extension theorems involve some kind of non-degeneracy condition on their subvarieties or their maps. And the easiest way to state this here is let's say that A is a simple abelian variety. And uh, 
let's say we have f from x to a and g from uh, x to a and g from y to a are morphisms, let's make them smooth, finite morphisms from smooth x and y. You don't need that, but let's. Uh, and again, so we're going to, we're going to, this, the statement I'm going to give is directly uh, deals with a product. And so let's assume, let's assume that the dimension of f of x plus the dimension of g is y is strictly bigger than the dimension of a. And so then the assertion is that, uh, then the assertion is what? That there exists, so then there exists an isogeny, uh, a twiddle to a, so that, uh, and fg factor through this map, let me call this p, And then the assertion, so this is the first assertion, and then the assertion is that, so everything's mapping to A twiddle, and then up on A twiddle, the assertion of the, uh, the fulton hansen theorem is true. And moreover, X, the inverse image of the diagonal on A twiddle, is connected. So in other words, it's the same kind of connectedness theorem as you got for the fulton hansen theorem, but you first, there has to be an isogeny in the picture and things factor through the isogeny. And then um, what's a corollary of this? So a corollary is that uh, say, so then the, the, so the corollary is that let's say that uh, x to a is an unramified finite morphism, and that we're in the dimensional hypotheses that we were in before. Okay, and so let's assume that um, let's assume that it's saying that twice uh, the dimension of x is bigger than the dimension of a, and then so we have a finite unramified morphism, and then the assertion is that um, then this is the only situation that happens, and s factors as, so there's some abelian variety that's isogenous to A, and uh, this is an isogeny. So basically, it's an embedding of some variety isogenous to A. So this is, so this is kind of the, I think the maximal, the maximally good analog, the maximally good generalization, and he has more general statements than this, but uh, the maximally good generalization of the fulton hansen theorem for boolean varieties. And then let me quickly state his result for number two. So again, I'm gonna state a very special case, but this is something that I had, others had wondered about and didn't see how to prove. So the theorem here, again, there's a much more general theorem. But so uh, let's let W in uh, Pn cross Pn be an irreducible subvariety of dimension n. And so I'm, the question I want to know is when does it happen that for every morphism coming in, the inverse image of the W is connected? And so the very nice answer, there's a, one way to say this, is let's assume that all the Kurnith components of W are, non, are non-zero. So all the Kurnith components 
of W, of the class of W, are non-zero. So in other words, any codimension n subvariety of Pn cross Pn is of the form, its cohomology of the form A0 times point times Pn plus A1 times line times Pn, uh, line times Pn minus 1, and so on. Plus, plus a sub n uh, pn cross point. So any subvariety on projective space on pn cross pn has a decomposition like this, and we are, so what we're assuming is that all the ai's are positive. So this is certainly true for the diagonal because in the diagonal all these coefficients are one. So the cohomology class of the diagonal is just the sum of all these things. And then the theorem is that W satisfies this, uh, the property of the, same, has the same properties of the diagonal in a product of projective space. So then, um, then uh, H from Z to Pn cross Pn is in the Fulton and Hansen theorem. So you have uh, H inverse of W is connected. Okay. So that somehow from this point of view, what explains the Fulton Hansen theorem is somehow that the diagonal is positive in the Kernet sense, that so all these components are positive. And how do you, so I, had, I mean, people have tried to prove this, but what we're overlooking is, so what the way Olivier gets this is that he proves a connectedness theorem where you replace Pn by Pn cross Pn, or more generally, any product of projective spaces, or more generally, Grassmannians. And then, uh, he, so the point is that there's some condition on subvarieties in there that give you a good connectedness theorem, and this is a very special case of that. So in any event, this, uh, I recommend these papers to you. There's a, there's a series, of maybe four or five papers, and they have a lot of interesting ideas. So I hope that um, that gives some, some idea of that. Okay, so luckily I think my talk, the, so after this meaty thing, I'm gonna give a slightly, we'll move to slightly more fluffy uh, and light material. So um, what my actual talk was gonna be about, um, my own talk was on uh, Cayley backrack theorems for, uh, uh, with excess vanishing, so A-R-A-C-H. So this is uh, work with Lawrence Ein. And um, so again, I, it's a little bit, so this is a, there's, I'm gonna remind you what the classical Cayley backrack theorem says. But um, so this is one extension of that. And uh, hopefully it's someday it'll have applications, but so far, uh, that's going to be a problem at the end to find some applications. But I think it's an amusing question, I hope. So let's start with uh, what is the classical, what is the, let me sort of, so now as I say, what is the classical Cayley backrack theorem? So this is the, you know, famous 8-9 point theorem. For if you have, uh, so the classical Cayley backrack theorem, let's say for curves in the plane, says consider two curves, D1, D2, in the plane, and let's assume that they intersect, so let's say of degrees little d1 and little d2, and let's say that they intersect transversely at a finite set uh, z. So z then contain, is, consists of d1 times d2 points. Okay, so what's the classical theorem? So the classical theorem says that uh, then any curve uh, of degree uh, d1 plus d2 minus 3 vanishing at all but one of the points of uh, z vanishes at the remaining one. Uh, 
Okay, so in particular, for example, the any cubic passing through eight of the nine points of intersection of two cubics passes through the ninth. Okay, so this is a very classical theorem. Actually, a nice exercise if you've never done it is if you remove one point of Z, what this means is that there's a find the third generator of the ideal of that, but I'm not gonna. Um, and of course, there's nothing special about, uh, the, there's an analogous statement for many hypersurfaces. You don't need them to intersect conversely, but I don't wanna dwell too much on this, so let me just say, uh, analogously, analogously. I mean, in this, uh, in this theorem, it's, uh, if it's transversal, you can make the curve of higher degree to be smooth, and it essentially is the fact that K plus. Yeah, yeah, this is an element, yes, 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 this is an elementary. Uh, I'm just saying because uh, I think Mumford points out this, uh, that you need second cohomology. You need second cohomology when the intersection is not transversal. Okay, right, I'm gonna prove, yeah, right, let's just, okay, so analogously, but, so analogously for hypersurfaces and PN, and non-transversal intersections, and so on. So, but as long as they're finite. Okay, so this is a, uh, so there actually, there seems there's a kind of an interesting history in all of this. There's a nice paper in the bulletin by Eisenbud, Green, and Harris discussing the history in great detail. So that's fun. But in any event, so this, um, so then I think the sort of geometric content of this theorem, as far as I know, it was this statement, uh, as far as I know, it was really Griffiths and Harris in 78, that's uh, realized that this is really a statement about zero loci of sections of a vector bundle. So let me, and I'm actually gonna give the proof. So let's say that X is a smooth projective variety of dimension N, and we have E, a vector bundle of rank N, on X, and then we have a section, uh, I'm sorry, and, and L is gonna be the determinant of E. So L is the determinant of E. And let's say we have a section, so let's consider a section of E. Whoops. So we'll take a section of E. Uh, that vanishes Let's say simply, you know, kind of transversely uh, on a finite subscheme Z. So the number of points in Z is uh, is uh, this top churn class of E. And again, there's no problem in having non-transversal, non-simple zeros, but you just that involves just making a certain number of dis discussing a little bit more than I want to. It's, it's completely well understood what to do if it's, what's that? I do this one at a time. It's completely well understood what to do if you have a knot. Okay. So then the claim is that the zero locus, this Z, satisfies the cayley backrack property with respect to the canonical bundle of X times uh, the canonical bundle of X plus uh, the canonical bundle of X plus uh, the determinant of E plus L. Okay, so then the assertion is that then, then, uh, so then the assertion is that if we take any, so this is the assertion of the Griffith-Harris theorem, if we take any section of OX of canonical bundle plus the determinant of E vanishes at all but one of the points of the points of Z, then it vanishes, then it also vanishes at the remaining one.
Okay, so the, the Cayley backrack theorem, and I think it was this was maybe first Griffiths and Harris who realized this. A classical Cayley backrack theorem. So of course, if you take L a, a sum of line bundles on projective space, then you get that classical theorem. So the minus three here is the canonical bundle of projective space. Okay, so let me let me kind of let's look at the Griffiths Harris proof of this because I think it's kind of. Uh, so I hope I have. Okay, so the whole idea is that from the Griffiths Harris point of view, this is a consequence of um, well, a Kazool, the exactness of a Kazool complex plus duality. The Cayley backrack theorem is some kind of manifestation of duality. So what, the, what we do is we form the Kazool complex uh, determined by the section S. So let's see, where am I going to put this? I guess I can write small and put this here. So what is that going to do? The Kazool complex, if you have a section of a vector bundle that vanishes nicely on a smooth variety, because the Kazool complex resolves the, um, the zero locus of that. So on the, I'll work from right to left. We have wedge n of E dual to wedge n minus 1 of E dual and so on. Here we get to E dual. Uh, we go to OX, and we go to O of Z, and these maps are just given by contraction with S. So we contract with S, and so S is a section from O to E, so that maps us from E dual to O, wedge two of E dual to E dual, and so on. And then because Z has dimension zero, and X is smooth, this is an exact, this is exact. Okay. So now let's tensor this. We tensor this by O of kx plus L. And remember that L is the determinant of E. So L is wedge n of E. So when we tensor through by this, we get another exact sequence. So this is an L dual. So over here, we're going to get O of kx. And then here, we're going to get, it doesn't really matter, wedge n minus 1 e dual tensor O of kx plus L and so on. And we go all the way over here. We get e dual tensor kx plus, actually, let me just, well, OK, I'll put that in. e dual tensor kx plus L. Here we get kx plus L. And then we finally map to OZ. Uh, twisted by kx plus l. And of course, this is also exact. OK. So notice here, all of these guys are vector bundles, except for this one here. This is just some kind of uh, finite gadget. OK, now if you have a long exact sequence, I'm not going <laughs> to do this, of course. If you have a long exact sequence like this, you can cut it into short exact sequences. So I can put a gadget here, I can put a gadget there. And if you trace through what you get, you get a map from H0 of this going to H1 of that. H1 of this goes to H2 of that, and so on. So if you cut into short exact sequences, you get finally a map delta from H0 of OZ of KX plus L. And you end up, if you go through it, into HN on x of, k, uh, of ox of kx. So just by uh, tracing this through, sh cutting it into short exact sequences, and chasing through, you get a map like that. Now, you get a little bit more than that, because coming into o h naught of ox, oz of kx plus l, you have a h naught of ox of kx plus l. So in fact, what you get is you get, in fact, you get a sequence of maps H naught of X, OX of KX plus L. And this maps to just by restriction to the kernel, into the kernel. And here we have our delta to HN of KX. And, and this may or may not be exact, but the composition is zero. So the composition is zero.
Okay, so uh, you have this funny map from H naught of OZ of KX plus L, this maps to HN of KX, and this thing lives in the kernel. Okay, so of course, uh, <laughs> what is, uh, Whoops, I see, now this is the one I do by hand. So the, the question, of course, is what is this funny map from, um, what is this funny map from H naught of OZ to HN of KX? Well, the point is that uh, uh, E <laughs> tensored by OZ is the normal bundle of Z and X. It seems a little silly, but that's what it is. And then the point is, so what this means is that O, X, rather OZ of KX plus L is what? That's KX tends to the determinant of the normal bundle. So this is just the canonical, the canonical sheaf of Z. So what is this map? So we have this funny map from H naught of OZ of KX plus L. Uh, mapping by chopping this thing up into short exact sequences of OX of KX, HN of OX of KX, and by this is dual to H naught, so this is H naught of omega Z, but Z is zero dimensional, so this is dual to H naught of OZ, and this of course is dual to H naught of OX, so we've got a map from H naught of OZ dual to H naught of OX dual, and of course, what could this possibly be? It's the dual of just the canonical restriction map. So the next step into the proof is to assert with conviction that that must be the dual. What? And let me finish. <laughs> I mean, for the, I, I, if I have time at the end, I'm going to state a more general theorem where I really want to know. Let, let, let me finish this. Yeah, but I don't want to use extension classes. Let, let me just, yeah, I mean, right. So the point is that, the, so the lemma, the lemma is that this map is dual, map is dual to the restriction. Okay, so let's just grant this, and then we're done. You see, because the point is, if you look at the natural basis of this, the map is given in the natural basis by just, uh, so, um, how to say this? So map, uh, so, you know, in the natural basis, so uh, the basis just is, uh, is the, this delta is given by the matrix one, 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 one. So what that, but what that, but then that proves the theorem because it means if you have a section of here that goes to zero there, it can't be non-vanishing at just one point. So uh, if you take a section of X that was non-vanishing at all but one point, it couldn't map to zero. So this is uh, so QED. So again, you don't need to. I mean. <laughs> uh, as I say, there, there, there's the, if I have time at the end, I'll discuss this theorem of tan and VVEG that generalizes this. And then you really, I mean, you do need to worry about what that map is. Okay, fine. So that's the, uh, that's the classic theorem. Now, um, the starting point of this uh, story that I want to talk about today was a theorem of a, a person in Shanghai called, uh, uh, there's a theorem of a person in Shanghai, uh, Mu, Mu Lin Li. So uh, this is from, well, I think that it appeared on the preprints a year or two ago, but just got published. So he uh, proposed a variant. And again, there's no problem in taking the zeros to be non-simple. I mean, you have to just, just decide what you mean. I mean, that's well understood. So he proposed a variant. Uh, involving excess vanishing. Okay, so what was his um, what was his result? So let's see what he did.
Okay, so um, uh, so what's the setup? So the setup is this. So we have x, e, and l, which was the determinant of e as before. And again, he's going to take a section of e. Now remember, e has the same rank of as uh, the rank of e is the same as the dimension of x. So you, again, you expect this to have dimension zero. But let's assume that this has some components of the zeros. Uh, uh, the zeros of s are now allowed to have uh, some positive dimensional components. So, so let's say that the zeros of s, so in his setting of s, so let me, in his setting, it's something like this. So as scheme theoretically, uh, w union z. So what is this? So w will be some smooth subvariety of some dimension, smooth subvariety of some dimension. Little w. And then. So yeah. the, rank of e is always the rank of E is always n, yeah. Right. Um, and z is a non empty finite, you know, reduced set, non empty finite uh, reduced set. So what's the picture to keep in mind? So the picture to keep in mind is supposing you have three surfaces in P3 that vanish nicely along a curve plus at some isolated point. So that's the picture that we have here. Yes, yes, yes. And again, yes, no, that's important, right? And it doesn't really matter that Z be kind of simple points, but it certainly has to be disjoint from W. So again, think of as three surfaces in P3 vanishing along a curve plus some points. That's going to be my example. Okay, now he wants the, the conclusion is going to be, is going to be that you want to say that any uh, section of the K plus L that vanishes on W plus all but one of the points of Z vanishes also with the remaining one. But there's a, a funny hypothesis here. So what's the hypothesis? So in general, we have an exact sequence. Uh, the normal bundle of W in X is always a sub uh, bundle of E restricted to W. So E restricted to W is what kind of the normal bundle would be if W were points, but the W would actually have higher co-dimension. And then you get some exact sequence like this. So this is a vector bundle of rank W. Uh, can you just blow up? Well, that's going to be the idea, right. But, transformation of vector bundle. Right, and that's going to lead, that will get, that's how multiplier ideals are going to come into the picture eventually. Right, so um, so Baumann state Lee's theorem. So you get this, and then the um, his his theorem is that he wants to assume that this splits. So this is the funny, uh, so this is the funny hypothesis, and then his theorem. So Lee's theorem. So this is Lee's theorem. So if you assume that this sequence splits then um, any section of OX of KX plus L that vanishes on W and all but one of the points, one of the points of Z vanishes also on the remaining one. Okay, so that's his that's his theorem. Okay, but of course, the, so what's the and he it's his proof. You know, there's a you know there are people there there are analytic side to this story. So his proof uses what he calls virtual residues. Um, you can, I mean Griffiths and Harris kind of saw their argument and I mean whoops, they phrased their argument in terms of residues. So you can think of this map here as a residue map, and then you're saying that the sum of the residues is zero. Okay, so the question then, 
Uh, so what we should ask, the question is... Uh, so I don't understand what you wrote, because any section vanishing on W or vanish. Any section that van okay. Any section that's the hypo it's like okay, so oh, that's vanished. Yeah, any section that vanishes. Okay. Good. Can you do you want me to write it down or can you <laughs> <laughs> in case of confusion you can ask for Brizio and he'll so and the, any section that vanishes on W and all but one of the points of Z vanishes at the remaining one. Okay. So now the question then is can but the the question then is can we get away uh, so now let's ask, uh, uh, is statement true without this, uh, without this funny, uh, uh, without this funny splitting hypothesis? So can we avoid this funny splitting hypothesis? And uh, you try the first example that comes to mind, and the answer is no. So let's see an example. So, okay. Okay, so what happens if you avoid the splitting hypothesis? So let's see, let's see um, an example. So, um, so let's take, a, let's take the first, uh, let's just take a, so let's consider uh, a rational normal curve. So C and P3, a rational normal cubic. And let's consider, uh, let's look at, um, take general surfaces, Q1, Q2, and F, containing C, where the Q's are quadrics, and the degree of F is, let's say, some large D, so D bigger than two. Okay, so we have um, three uh, surfaces in P3, two quadrics and a cubic, uh, two quadrics and a surface of degree D, and they're all passing through this rational normal curve. Okay, so what does the intersection of these things look like? Well, first of all, rem remember what happens if you take the intersection of two quadrics through a rational normal curve. So uh, Q1 intersect Q2 is the rational normal curve union a secant line. So let me draw a picture here. Um, okay, so here's C, and if I take the intersection of um, two cubics, two quadrics through C, I get um, C union a secant line. Now what happens if I intersect this whole thing with another general surface F, so then, uh, Q1 intersect Q2 intersect F will be C, and then F intersects this line in um, D points, but two of the points, let me call these points A1 and A2, so plus uh, some number D minus three other points, or D minus two other points, and so this is our Z. So if I take three general, if I take Q1 intersect Q2 intersect uh, F, what I'm going to get is the scheme theoretically C union Z, and this is going to be D minus two points. So it's the D minus two other intersection points of F with L. Okay, so what would be Lee's conclusion? So we need to ask, want to know. Uh, so the conclusion of Lee's conclusion would be. Uh, so is it true? So what would the conclusion be? That um, any surface of degree, so what are the degrees? So two plus two plus D minus four, so that's D, uh, that passes through C and 
uh, d minus 3 of the points of z passes through the remaining one. So is this true? Well, the answer is no, because we just take any, let's say, take a cubic through C and take d minus 3 hyperplanes, each meeting one of the points of z. So this is not true. So OK, so the conclusion of, of Lee's theorem is false in this case. So we can't avoid, in general, the splitting hypothesis. You would get a much more simple counterexample by considering two points with the same plane uh, component uh, in P2. Well, yeah, but I mean, his thing isn't that interesting in P2, right? I mean, right, but let me, uh, but I want to continue this example. So now let's say, let's say instead of looking at surfaces that are just passed simply through C, supposing I have a surface that passes doubly through C. So can, let's say in the, in, the, in the situation of the example, Uh, uh, let's say that H is a surface of degree D that, uh, that passes doubly through C. So in other words, H is singular along C. But I mean, in your example, I mean, you could have done the example just with the split quadric surface. So yeah, I, I'm not claiming that's the simplest example, but it, I'm hoping that there's a pedagogical purpose. So let me, okay. <laughs> I'm not, I mean, of course, just, okay. <laughs> okay. So supposing now, and I keep in that example, and supposing now I have a surface of degree D that passes doubly through C plus, um, uh, plus, in addition, d minus 3 of the points of z. So instead of just, I, I know that this example is bothering everybody, but instead of, just bear with me, so instead of, instead of just asking that it pass simply through c, let me ask what happens if I insist that it pass doubly through c. Well, then how many times does this surface meet the line? So it meets L four to, twice at a1, twice at a2, plus d minus three other points. So it's, I've accounted for d minus one intersections of the surface with L. And so what this means is that, so then, uh, then in fact, in this case, H has to contain L, so, so H also can p passes through uh, the last point of Z. And I agree we could do the same thing in the plane if we wanted to, but that has less dramatic effect. So, okay. So the point now is that if I, instead of just ask for surfaces that pass simply through the curve, I ask about surfaces that pass doubly through the curve, then in this example, the conclusion is true. And so that's the first general statement, that, that that's true. What? You have a third plane. Yeah, but it's too far back, and it, it's in the shadows, so. <laughs> yes. OK. So what's the, what's, the, what's the first theorem? So the first theorem is, so in the situ same situation as before, um, so as before, so, you know, given S a section of E, uh, let's assume again as before that the zeros of S are W intersect Z. So this is again as before, a smooth of dimension W, and this is some finite set. And again, let me just, to avoid problems, uh, let me just make Z. Nice. So then the theorem is just what this last example uh, shows. So the theorem is just, um, the theorem is that, uh, so let's, uh, yeah, now let's suppose uh, that H 
and kx plus l, uh, suppose h and kx plus l has multiplicity at least uh, w plus 1 along w, um, well, period. And then if, um, if h passes through, all, then the Cayley back rack is true, which h passes through all but one of the points uh, of z, it passes through the remaining one. So in other words, the claim is to get the, uh, the, K, the right Cayley back rack theorem, you have to impose in this situation some multiplicity of vanishing along, along z, along wm. Okay, so what's going on here? I mean, what is making uh, uh, this true? So this is a special case of a more general theorem. So the claim is that the right statement of Cayley back rack for excess vanishing should involve multiplier ideals. So let's see how that, that goes. So which is special, this is a, so the theorem uh, is a special case of a more general statement involving uh, multiplier ideals. Okay, so how does, uh, um, how does this go? So again, let's stay in the same situation as before. And um, whoops. Uh, okay. And um, Okay, so in the same situation as before, so say, say um, you know, x, e, and l is, are as above. Uh, and now let's say I have, again, I have a section S of e. But now what I want to do is I want to assume that S vanishes arbitrarily along some subscheme plus at finitely many points. So let's assume now uh, that, that the zeros of S look like this. So I, it's just, it's gonna be the zeros of a random ideal B, uh, disjoint union Z, so Z will be some kind of non-empty, nice, uh, nice, Again, it doesn't, finite set. It has to be finite, but otherwise it doesn't really matter. But let's just assume it's reduced. So what do I mean by this? So what I'm asking, I'm asking that if I look at the map, so this section, you know, contraction with S gives me um, a map from E dual to OX, and I'm asking that the image of this map be B, some random ideal B, times the ideal of z, where uh, they're disjoint. So b plus iz is ox. OK. Now, um, so in the, in the previous example, the b was just the ideal of this nice smooth thing. Now, any time you have an ideal sheaf, you can define multiplier ideals, so I won't uh, so these are ideals that measure in some somewhat delicate way the singularities of elements of B. So I want the multiplier ideal of B to the M for various powers of B. So this is a ideal in OX. And I'm not going to define it. But um, uh, the theorem then, the sort of the, the right theorem here, uh, is this, is that the right theorem involves these multiplier ideals. And the point is that if, if B is the ideal of a smooth thing, we can compute, com, compute the multiplier ideal. So the theorem then is that every section 
uh, that every section H in uh, OX of KX plus L times the multiply ideal of B to the N, so N is the dimension always, that vanishes, uh, that vanishing at all but one of the points of Z also vanishes at the remaining one. Okay, so that's the, that's the theorem. Now, how, well, how does this, what happens if we know that B defines a smooth variety? Well, the point is that then... How are the multiplier ideals included? I mean... Well, as you take higher powers, the ideals get deeper. What? As you take higher powers, the ideals get deeper. How are multiplier, how are they included in what? Into each other. I of B grows or? Yes, they get deeper. Well, it depends what you mean. I of B squared is contained in I of B. Okay. They get farther away from O. Yeah. Well, but that. <laughs> what? B is totally random, except it's disjoint from Z. But you say that. The power, of the, power, the dimension is n. The dimension is the dimension of x. It's the dimension of x, always the dimension of x. Okay, um, so how does this imply, so why does this imply uh, theorem A? Well, the point is, uh, so the point is that if, if B is the ideal sheaf of W where W in x is smooth of some dimension, little w, then you can compute these things, and the multiplier ideal of b to the n is the ideal sheaf of w to the dimension of w plus one. So that's where that previous statement is coming from. So if you have the ideal of a curve, uh, the multiplier ideal is, um, is um, the multiple ideal to the multiple ideal of the ideal of the curve to the nth power is the ideal of the curve squared. Or if W is a finite set and reduced finite set, then this is just the classical statement. Okay, so what's the intuition? I mean, you wrote, uh, sorry, I didn't, you wrote P to the n. The, the yes, n is always a dimension. Okay, sorry. That justifies my stupid question because I read n. <laughs> okay, so let me tell you the, the, uh, the intuition, then I'll end with the proof, which Fabrizio is more or less already. So, so why do you expect something like this uh, for theorem B? So why would you expect multiply ideals to come into the, into the picture? So why does the classical theorem of cayley backright fail? I mean, why, I mean, what goes wrong really in the tan situation? So the point is that the, the classical uh, uh, cayley Griffiths harris fails uh, in the presence of uh, excess vanishing because uh, if uh, S vanishes excessively, Then, um, then the Kazul complex uh, is not exact. So you can certainly write down the Kazul complex. Uh, the Kazul complex determined by S is not is not exact anymore. It's not an exact sequence of sheaves. So if you take the Kazul complex and you try to cut it into short exact sequences, you I mean it gets to be a big mess. That doesn't work. 
So the argument I gave with the Griffiths-Harris theorem I gave in the, uh, earlier just doesn't work because you get what you get isn't an exact sequence. But the point is, what is true is this, there's always universally a subcomplex uh, sub of the causal complex that is exact. So however, uh, you always have, uh, have an exact sequence which you might call I don't know, Skoda Kazool complex. Uh, so there's a specific there's a specific subcomplex of the Kazool complex that's always exact, and it involves these multiplier ideals. Uh, so you start with wedge n of E dual, and then you uh, you in you do the this is the Kazool complex, but now we're going to multiply by the multiplier ideal of B. Then we're going to get wedge n minus 2 of E dual multiplied by the multiplied deal of B squared, and so on. And let's see, you end up with E dual tensor the multiplied deal of B to the dimension minus 1. And then you're going to end up with the multiplied ideal of B to the n. And then I'll throw in my ideal of Z. So if I, I can, I mean, and this is a subcomplex of the Kazool complex, right? Because this is living in E dual, this is living in, and so on. This is living in O. Well, this is living in I, Z. I'm thinking of the Kazool complex. OK. And so the claim is that, so this is a subcomplex of the Kazool complex, and this is always exact. And what? Yeah, yeah, of course that's how you're going to prove the theorem, right. But this is, I think, the way, right, so this is the intuition. Right, so this is always exact, and then you can, you can kind of try to argue as before. So this is the intuition, and then, of course, the proof of the theorem, as Claire says, is you just proof of the actual quick way to prove the theorem is you just apply the classical theorem on a log resolution. Uh, so you don't need to actually go through all of this. Apply a log, apply the classical theorem uh, theorem on a log resolution of B. So that's actually how you. Uh, so that's how you actually prove the theorem. But I mean, I think it, I mean that, that of course is where this this comes from too. So uh, I think it's six of one and half of this. So I mean that's. But anyway, so maybe this is a good place. I, there's a, there's a sort of a, a more general Cayley backrack theorem um, that involves kind of. I, mean, I, I think I'll. This is a good place to stop. There's a, there are more general theorems that also extend to this excess situation. But um, so again, um, maybe I'll end. So as, as <laughs> there's nothing much, I mean, once you realize what the statement has to be, of course, there's nothing involved, much involved in proving it. But um, there are some questions. So there should be applications. One of the ways we got into this is this question, if you have, rational maps to projective space, people have been interested in bounding the degrees of those. And there's this argument involving Cayley backrack. But in principle, this is giving you a sort of a stronger, um, so, um, a stronger statement. So the question is, so let me, let me just let's say questions. Uh, so the main question is to find applications. So <laughs> the, I, I think probably the interesting statements are the more general ones. But to fibers, uh, to uh, fibers um, of rational maps to Pn. Another possible place, again, I don't know, what about zeros of one forms, right? Uh, supposing you have a one form on a variety that has, uh, whose zeros are positive dimensional. I mean, in principle, there's a statement, but what does it say? And then the last question, I don't know whether there's a, there, there is there like a, one of the ways of proving the classical Cayley backrack theorems is what's called the theory of liaison, where you have, well, I'm not going to tell you in a second what liaison is, but the question is, is there a kind of a theory of liaison for these excessive vanishing situations? But I think this is a good place to stop, so I'll stop, I'll stop there.